people would want to know, people will want to know, like if walking is, is actually good. Cause they're always being told like they should walk by their doctors and by reader's Ooh, digest and wherever else. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about yes. that. Yes. One of those great blind recommendations for people. Now I understand the intentions, right? A, a physician's intentions are honorable when they say, you need to you need to get more exercise. You should start walking, yes. but but it, again, it's a blind recommendation because because everybody makes an assumption that they understand what the doctor means by that. Um, but some people aren't even qualified to do that to a significant degree yet. Welcome to Reconsider. I'm Bill Hartman. This is the podcast to challenge you to ask better questions, to look beyond traditional models of thinking, and arrive at better health and fitness solutions. It's, uh... All right. Hey, Chris. Hey. What are we talking about today? <laughs> I was thinking of like doing the whole YouTube, the famous YouTube influencer way to like introduce where you like you use your hands and you're like really animated and you do stuff like this when you talk. Yeah. <laughs> walking. What's the deal with walking? Oh, is that, how do is you that do it? Is, is, that how it useful for, is it useful for exercise? Blah, blah, blah. No, but like today, today we would like to talk about walking as, okay. an, as an exercise, as an activity, um, because to peek behind the curtain a bit, Bill and I are, are creating a program for people who are trying to get in shape, but keep failing or people trying to bridge the gap between, you know, their, their PT and their return to activities and walking and steps and things like that can be a pretty good uh, way to just drive movement after you're able to reconstruct quality movement for a certain individual i'd say would be a good way to put it so we're gonna we're gonna touch on the walking as a movement behavior things that are typically done wrong people's misconceptions of walking uh we'll talk about like where step counts come from where the idea of walking for fitness comes from mm -hmm. and then that will be sort of the the uh theme of this this podcast let me get my timer going here. Make sure we got. Okay. Do you, so I think typically when people think of walking, it's become in the last, let's say, I know in the, I think it was JFK was in charge of creating, helping the military create an uh, evaluation for marching. And I think it was 50 miles. And around that time, I don't remember the exact date of that, uh, when that test became popularized, but that's when walking as like a fitness uh, marker or as a way to get in shape or as a way to be healthy became much more popularized. And I believe around the same time in Japan is when they started tracking. There you go. It's actually, so from That's where the 10,000 steps thing comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. um. let me look up the name of it. Uh, uh, something, the, pie. something pie. Uh, um, it's hyphenated. My Japanese is not very it's, good. Mine's much better than yours. But it's, um, <laughs> I actually study, I study it a bit. It was pre-Olympics. Uh, it was pre-Olympics. They were trying to sell, they were trying to sell pedometers. Yes. And, so the, it's, the, it's actually called a man poke. There you man go. Okay means 10,000 step measure. Yeah, there you go. And that, so that's and that they, comes. they, and they've, people have looked into it to see like where the, what the basis for it is. And it was more or less just some guy being like, that seems like a good number. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, it's and I think, I think they polled Japanese citizens and it was like, scientific. The, the lower end was like 5,000. And then the people who seemed to be active were, you know, and they just picked a random number out of the air. And then this has become the gold standard going yes. forward. Right. And so even the research is, the research is trying to follow this, right? So, th so they've looked at, they've looked at 2,000 and 6,000 and 8,000 and 10,000. And yeah. yeah. And there's like this incrementalism that's associated with some measure of health or the ability to sure. set cardiovascular disease. By yeah, that all cause mortality. Like every 2,000 steps, you buy yourself 10% reduction in cardiovascular uh, health concerns. It's like, okay. Well, that that sells devices and that sells well, it does. programs. It, it and, does. Yeah. But then it, but it's like, you know, uh, 
then you got you got those folks that are they're wearing their you know everybody has to have a monitoring device now and uh so they're wearing their uh, you, <laughs> my my or as i wear my aura ring and my fitbit together and then you compare them you go well they're not the same um no. they're pretty close though aren't, aren't they pretty close uh the step counting is not it's yeah. whatever they're they are <laughs> i'd like, say neither of them are valid but both of them are reliable Right. Okay. There you go. That, that's probably useful. But then, you, yeah. but then the concern is, is like, okay, uh, what the 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 if you were to take ten thousand steps consecutively, instead of like spaced out over a day, that would be what the equivalent of like I don't know, four miles so around. Yeah, two thousand steps to mile, but that's based on like averages. So let's say you you know, yeah. five five miles, four to yeah. five miles in two thousand steps. Yeah. So whatever your monitor is capable of, of is whatever it's sensitive to. Yeah. You know, it could it could be somebody that talks a lot with their hands. Yeah. So the, the know, algorithms was, I'm sure get updated. Yeah. And and you know I don't know as a generic target I suppose it's okay but we can do better. I so mean, we will. We've talked, we've touched on research and what research actually means and how if you go looking for something you'll find it in research. Right. Um, yeah. But there, there is some pretty promising research that I've read that puts a good marker for active people around like eight thousand yeah. steps, seven to eight thousand steps as a low. And then not, when when they how about we do them more consecutively? Yeah, yeah, that with intention. Like, with if, intention. If it's yeah, so it's not it's not because we've already talked about how you don't believe in non-exercise activity. I hate that. And, and hate adding that. it, I hate. So there that. is. I'll that's for back weight. on that. That's for lightweights and weak people. You'll have to tune into previous episodes <laughs> to hear us talk more about neat. <laughs> uh, but we can touch on it a little bit now. So there are people that tend to be fidgety and they do a lot more like standing up, shaking their legs, scratching their fingernails, stuff like that. They tend to burn more calories. They have a higher basal metabolic rate. But when you think about that, it's like, well, duh. duh. <laughs> yes. But that's what, yeah. but see, that behavior is a byproduct of anxiety uh, anxiety and personality and and such right yeah it's gastrointestinal not, distress it's not, or... it's not with it it's not with with great intention or as a byproduct right. of vigorous work vigorous work so if you you could go back and you can look at uh i believe they were looking at dock workers um at one point I... and, and and they were they were showing like like their risk of cardiovascular incident was much lower than their sedentary counterparts and it's not that they sought out um in, intentional exercise it was that that their their work demanded such physicality and, and so um that was not intentional per se to become healthier it was intentional because that's what they did for a living and so there's a certain element of continuous activity there's certain periods of intensive intermittent activity that are that are that are obviously beneficial and so just randomly talking about like 10 like if you took 10,000 casual steps periodic like spaced out over a day versus 10,000 consecutively i would hazard to guess that we're going to have a significant difference in the benefits Sure. And it's just, it's more about, I believe the step counting thing is good from a behavioral perspective, because it's more about making you perceive yourself as an active person. And it or, sort of gamifies it or, uh, in a way. Or, or what? Or it's an attempt to pat yourself on the back and saying, well, I did this for my health. Um, when you could have just like uh, quit drinking, stop eating so many cheeseburgers and bacon, maybe eat a, a vegetable every now and then and do some intentional exercise. It's like, come on. It's like, OK, maybe maybe this maybe this is your initiation into the world of activity. Great. If that's yeah. your, if that's your starter kit, I'm I'm happy for you. But I want you to do more and and don't be satisfied with that as your substitution for what you really need. Sure. To do. So, okay. I think I think it can definitely be something that's a catalyst for that because of because of what's happened because when you when you're talking about intention the intentionality, I think that's a word, right? The intentionality <laughs> of of the exercise you're performing and you going out knowing that I'm walking this route, it's going to take me about this long, I'm going to feel this way and then you do it, that creates a really big feedback loop of dopamine. Right. which will be something that will be the fuel for a continued behavior and motivation to do said behavior over and over again. And, and walking is just such a great tool for that, just for in, in the 
just in the way that it allows you to do something continuous, like kind of like get into more of like a flow state, if you want to call it that, like talking, thinking about well, like, now we're talking about a whole different, different aspect of the benefits of this. So. Yeah. Cause I also want to talk about like famous minds throughout history who have walked oh, Aristotle, oh. Socrates, they used to have like ah. walking, walking uh, lectures. Uh, every Benjamin, every Benjamin writer. Franklin, uh, um, Da Vinci went for walks. Da Vinci actually invented a pedometer. <laughs> Of course he did. <laughs> yeah, just amongst some other anyone, a lot of people fly. who are in. But uh, yeah, he did, maybe it was maybe he was trying to make something that flew yeah, exactly. out of like his bottom of it. Yeah, but it's I, it's because there's such a benefit to, especially before we're in now we're in this like hyper dopamine world where it's just like everywhere and it's just you have these like toxic dopamine. Uh, surges from everything and then right. before before you had coffee and stimulants that would help kick that loop into high gear you would have people that would you know need to walk to try to find this this state or be active in order to try to find the state or turn to other things drugs and alcohol yeah i'm trying to think of, like it was, i think it was Kant that was that was notorious for like every day at three yeah it was like it was well, like throw healthy. yeah like all these like brilliant minds and people that have like these 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 like this forethought uh tesla i believe was a walker uh, as well yeah but you think about you think about the elements of what's going on here it's it, if if you can reach a state where you have the reduction of that prefrontal influence there is there is health associated with that not only yeah. that but be, because again it's 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 turning off your uh your your uh, the, animal the, brain yeah if you will primitive yeah so so everyone that doesn't know what the prefrontal cortex is you have you have a more primitive version of your brain uh yeah. if, if you believe in oh, my video dropped out that's all right editing <laughs> so i'll put my hands up <laughs> there you go okay uh and so we have more <laughs> we have more of a primitive if you're thinking evolutionarily part of our brain and that's our our very like snap reaction snap judgment type of brain it doesn't right. allow us to kind of sit with whatever input is coming into the brain think about it create a, a decision about what to do and then act upon it it's more like i stub my toe i scream out an expletive or someone cuts me off on the throughway i pull i cut them off pull them over and then shoot them with a gun like that's what happens and that's the most extreme example of what would happen Yes. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> or be reactive versus responsive. And then. And yeah. There you go. That's the same. The most simple, a more simpler way to put it would be reactive versus uh, right. thought, thoughtfully responsive. Right. But but yeah. what Con conscientious what, even. Yeah. And, and it, again, the, the 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 flow states tend to be those that that we we seek out because they feel good. Yeah, and if you want, if you want to learn more about flow states, I believe it's Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, yes. Yeah, um, his and his book is um, called Flow, right? Can I can I make a better suggestion? Okay, I believe. Yeah. Okay. What's what would be okay. a better one? I didn't like that book. It's tough. It's a hard. It's it's it's, it's, it's pretty uh, yeah. exceptionally dry and boring. Here's a great book that is fun. Also has a documentary behind it, The Rise of Superman. Ah, which, has, yes. which has nothing to do with the superhero who's the author i don't remember that's unfortunate yeah. um, but they're talking about they're talking about like the extreme athletes and and they get into some some of the decent science they're going to talk about um a, a little bit about the brain they're going to talk about neurotransmitters they're going to talk about um the waveforms and things like that Stephen uh, kotler there you go there you go um, yeah, that is a really good book. For, it's for a talking great about book because it, it's it's a fun read. It it and it 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 uses great stories. One of them, unfortunate, um, but great stories. And then, so read the book first, then watch the documentary. That's how okay. I would. Do, that's how I would do. Yeah, it. I don't think I've ever actually watched watched the documentary, so I'll oh, put that oh, on my did, list. Of they, they did a great job. Like I said, just just one unfortunate scenario. Um, yeah, you need to prepare yourself for. Um, but but it's a great it's a great book. It's a great book. He read another one that I didn't enjoy nearly as much. And there's something about fire. What was that? Uh, Don't remember. 
Yeah, I can't remember that one. Um, it was not as if good. You, I, if you know I, the name of Stephen Kotler's other book, leave it in the comments <laughs> and we can talk about it. <laughs> and while and while you're at it, like go ahead and like this episode and all the other episodes that we have. And like if, and you, if you so I guess subscribe isn't as big anymore. Oh, really? I, I don't know. It's the, the, the algorithm is strange and no one can ever really be ahead of it. So it seems that commenting and sharing and um, liking seem to be more important and it's just the yeah it's the things that clicking on the things because everyone everyone now navigates youtube via the home screen i guess no one actually goes to their subscriptions anymore because you know there's that little button on the side that says subscriptions but no one ever presses it they just go by because the home screen algorithm seems to be really smart and it'll send you the right way gotcha based on the things that you're watching and the associated things so you know like share comment Okay. All those things are helpful. Plus, go Bill ahead. and I, Bill and I are in the comment section, talking with with you all. So, there you go. Please jump in there. So, so far we've talked a little bit about where walking for fitness comes from. Yep. We tied up. We talked about the ten thousand steps. How that is just like an arbitrary thing, which is pretty funny. But the research that has come from that idea is sort of promising. Uh, but it, it like lends itself. Active. It's like, come on. It's, it, like, it's okay. yeah. It lends itself just to being. If you're more more active, cultures seem healthier. It's like, well, right. let's let's throw another obvious statement out there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So then we we talked about that. We talked a little bit about the benefits of walking from like a mental state and and flow creativity. state and dopamine creativity. and creativity and yeah. and thought and problem being, being able. To, yeah, exactly. Like give walking yourself meditation, a... walking meditation, right? Sure. Like here's, here's the hard thing. Here's the hard thing for most people at this point, because of the, the constant demand for input, 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 um, is try to go for a walk, like a legit walk without media, right? Nothing Very in difficult. your face, nothing in your ears, right? And just get in your head, right? Um, that's it's tough at first it's very difficult it's, this is one of the reasons why you know most people don't like meditation is because it's exceptionally difficult but the idea is is that you do get used to being in your own head and you do learn to self regulate and so there's a lot of benefits more benefits to that than listening to your favorite podcast like this one um as you go for your walk but so do this listen to this as you go for your first walk of the day second walk of the day turn everything off right there you go. I mean, that's good. Yeah. It's like, if you, if you think of the stream of consciousness that everyone has as just like a fire hose, then you, you sort of, you can develop your ability to modulate the flow of right. the fire hose by, by being able to do things like these continuous and these activities that allow you to, you know, find a rhythm almost. It's almost like you, you finding a rhythm and then you having the time and the space because you when you're outside especially like you just your surroundings your peripersonal space is is expanded and Absolutely. the space above you is li- almost limitless so that actually increases your your uh, mind's ability to be open right and then you know and there's a lot of evidence as to as to where you can walk that is sure. of greater benefit you know this is like literally just an exposure to nature um reduces the the uh, sympathetic output from the from the nervous system, so again yeah. lowers your stress level just by the exposure, just by being out right. There. And sympathetic out. nervous system being your your fight or flight. Your, yeah, the one that, that gets you all cranked up, basically. Yeah, yeah. So again, again multiple ben- we're multiple benefits here. Yeah, like I can't, so let's like like I I, I like. Let me give you my personal experience. I walk almost every day. In fact, I walk two miles before this call today. Yeah, and I I try. I take my. I get a lot of. I get a lot of non-exercise steps because I'm taking care of my son all day. <laughs> but that's but exercise. It, it's yeah, it is crazy exercise. And then I I take him on a, usually an hour walk every day. So I get you know close to ten thousand steps in a day. But that's really not my go- my goal. It's just a matter of it's a consequence of everything that's happening in my life. I don't want to get too into the brain stuff and the other right. things that aren't as tangible because I want to help people to know, like people would want to know, people will want to know, like if walking is, is actually good. Cause they're always being told like they should walk by their doctors and by readers Ooh, digest and wherever else. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about yes. that. 
Yes. One of those great blind recommendations for people. Now, I understand the intentions, right? A, a physician's intentions are honorable when they say, you need to you need to get more exercise. You should start walking, but yes. but it, again, it's a blind recommendation because because everybody makes an assumption that they understand what the doctor means by that. Um, but some people aren't even qualified to do that to a significant degree yet. Right. So what would it would be good to think about this from a couple of mental models using like in in business and in sports and a lot of in a lot of realms you hear like key performance indicators right. it's like what are what are the qualifiers for you being able to walk well and then also you know asking it again is just asking the questions that aren't being asked and, and understanding that blind recommendations are recommendations that are given without context and that's right. probably the most important part that's missing from a blind recommendation is is the, the extra question or five questions or six whatever it takes in order for you to develop context to to boil it down to its most fundamental uh important parts right first and foremost pain pain um and and it's often recommended so especially for for uh people that will come go to the doctor and complain about lower back pain for instance yeah they will often get the re recommendation that oh you need to walk more without without the concern as to the mechanical element that might be emphasized to a significant degree as you're walking. Sure. Um, so those folks that actually use their spine to push down into the ground. So there's certain, certain postural adaptations and orientations of say your pelvis or your limbs that when you do push into the ground, you're, even though it seems like you've been doing this all your life, you are now doing it ineffectively from a health, an orthopedic health standpoint. And so- yeah. Again, it's like the these issues will just get then get magnified through repetition. And, and then over time, it can actually be detrimental to your orthopedic health. And so under these circumstances, especially if you've had pain, best to be evaluated by your friendly neighborhood health professional that can actually determine whether this would be a safe activity for you to participate in. Yeah, with with great. PT powers come great responsibility. <laughs> Something like that. Somebody's somebody's uncle. Somebody's uncle said that once. <laughs> somebody's uncle. Yes. Um, yeah. You. So that that, 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 brings up, that, uh, that brings up a really good point about because um, it's interesting because there are there are indeed some cases where if you sit a lot. So like for, for I'll give a personal example. When I when I moved to Florida during the pandemic. I was doing a lot more sitting than I was used to doing. So I used to be training people on a, on a weight room floor all day, standing, walking. Uh, went from you know ten hours of walking around training people to ten hours of sitting in a chair, and my back started to bother me. And what I one of the things that actually helped was getting up and going for walks. Um, but that doesn't mean that you could take that information like many doctors are taking it and say well, you should walk because if you don't sit, if you sit too much, you should just go walk. But there could be another reason why your back hurts. And then like what you were mentioning, if that has to do with the mechanics of how you move and walking is basically like the pure display of how a human being was was evolved to move, uh, that and like running basically and crawling probably if you want to step it back a uh, step. Um, but yeah, think, thinking about it from, from that perspective, it and people think also saying things like, what I've been walking my whole life. Is it is there actually a proper way to walk? What are the common things that people do wrong? I think we should talk about those things. Well, okay. So the your ability to walk is dependent on your ability to actually produce a turn. Okay. Because that's what walking is. So it's turning from one side. So, so if we were to look at the, you know, the what we call the center center of gravity. So if we take your body, there's a its densest area of pressure into the ground would be your center of gravity. Your center of gravity actually rotates from side to side as you're walking. It appears that we're walking in a straight line. We sense that we're walking in a straight line. Our eyes kind of contribute to a great deal of that. But we have a center of gravity that has to be able to rotate. So you have to actually be able to get from one side of your body to the other. And some people just really aren't good at that. Um, it could be yeah. activities that they've chosen to do. 
Um, it could be uh, just the fact that they are, are less physically active. Um, there are certain elements that influence the way that literally the way that, that you breathe that will become a limiting factor in your ability to walk efficiently. It doesn't mean that you can't walk. It just means that you don't do it efficiently. And then to superimpose mileage on top of that, you could actually be increasing mechanical loads on structure, producing tensions and pressures that eventually, eventually become problematic. So it might not be right away. Um, but this is why it's not it's not a problem until it's a problem. Exactly. It's like, the, here's the story. It's like my back never hurt until it started to hurt. Yes, that is correct. But up until that point, there were these gradual mini changes that were occurring over time that became additive or increased in magnitude. And then eventually you cross a threshold of awareness. And then that's when things start to feel bad. And again, yeah. it's, the, the problem is like you don't know which person you are. Right. Yeah. It's, it's one of those, it's one of those, you don't know what you don't know type of thing. So when yeah. something like this happens, it's always good to have another set of eyes, some, some with some expertise to be able to help you and to really think about and be observant of what are the things you're doing that tend to hurt. So if, if, you know, walking is good, but every time you do it, your right foot hurts, your right big toe hurts, then there's something wrong with how you're walking. It's not necessarily like, well, you know, this doctor told me to walk, so I'm going to do it, even though my foot hurts because he's told me that's important to do. It's like, no, ask the question, like why you had already mentioned pain is is just a disqualifier right away. Right. Um, but yeah, that the mechanics of walking is interesting. I'm going to put a bunch of pictures and stuff that I have of that actual turn happening through the center of gravity, the pressure map of the foot, because you can actually see the turn run from the heel up through the midfoot yeah. over to the big toe. Yeah. There's just a, this is cool. you see the direction, the directionality of the force. Yeah. And when we talk about flow, like this, where stuff's flowing in that turn. Yeah. Um, um, there's a, there's a couple dirty little secrets that are probably hiding um, in your closet. Um, if you look at a pair of shoes that you've worn a great deal, and you look at the back side of the shoe and you look at the outside edge of the heel. If it looks like it got sawed off um, on the outside edge, you're spending way too much time on the outside of your foot. The outside of your foot is not where you push hardest into the ground. You actually push yeah. it the entire foot, which where, I mean, where you should. Correct. The inside part of your foot is where like when you're pushing as hard as you can into the ground as you're walking. That's where that, that pressure has to go. If you're spending too much time on the outside edge, now you're going to predispose yourself to the inability to move from side to side. And so you, now you don't have that cool little shift of your center of gravity, which means that you're going to be what we would call somebody who compensates. And so you compensate for that lack of movement, but you're going to do it somewhere else in your body. So you're going to make something else that shouldn't do something, do something as a substitution. And that, yeah, that, that, that's where the problems arise. One of the more funnier, you know, I'll I'll find a video of some like big jacked guy trying to walk through a room and fit through a door where they just kind of waddle <laughs> back and forth. But, you know, when, when you think about compensation, if you add enough stress in a gravity field and you move enough and you give it enough time, the body is always going to choose the path of least resistance based on the imposition of whatever demands you're putting on top of it. So if I, the bodybuilding example, if I squeeze my body so hard with my muscles from front to back, I eventually lose that ability to turn. Great. So my walking becomes less of this flowing turning and more of this waddle. Like if I took my cell phone and tried to walk it on right. top of a desk. Yeah, we call those refrigerator turns. Because if you ever yeah. try to push the refrigerator out of that corner that they always jam it into, it's like you got to move one side, then the other side. then the, and, But there's no turn. It's just a big block well, that's... It's, I was thinking about this the other day, like that, that analogy is slowly going to die because everyone rents now. So it's like, <laughs> when does anyone, when does anyone buy or move a fridge anymore? It's like, oh. if they, if they need it, they just get their <laughs> landlord to buy a new one and install it. Um, yeah, but, but, uh, so think some, some key, some key things to think about that I usually end up talking to people about when we, when we go over walking, because it's something I always talk about with people, because it's important to realize that. If you only have, if you're a trainer or a therapist, or you're working with a trainer or a therapist, you're only with them maybe two, three hours a week, if you're lucky. And then the rest of that time you have to mess yourself up and, you know, humbly, you're going to have to come about it with some humility to know that like, it's actually your fault why you hurt. And because of the things that you're doing, the way that you are doing is, is, is creating this sort of issue. It's not anyone else doing this to you. Uh, yeah. But that, you know, if you're having help and you're, you're just trying to recapture these these important aspects of walking 
uh, feeling your heels hitting the ground and rolling through your, your foot has three rockers that you would call them with the heel, the ankle and the toe. So that it's a kind of like a, a wave and it sort of flows. Uh, and the typical compensation that you would see was what Bill referred to where people are on the outsides of their feet and their weights kind of shifted forward. So they figure out a way to either collapse into it to put push into the ground or they just kind of waddle on the outsides of their feet and their toes. So having that that heel hit go through the middle of the foot, push off the inside of the foot's important. Uh, allowing the other parts of your body to turn as well. So not locking your arms in place or putting your arms behind you because that takes away the ability to turn everything above the waist and the, the abdomen. And what's the magic cue for that there, young man, to get the arms to swing? The magic cue for the arm swinging? Yeah. I don't know. What Are you going to tell me? <laughs> well, you know this one. You know Probably. This one. I just don't know which one you want me to say. How do you know? you're Okay, if you're walking... And you're and you're not acutely aware of your arm swing. How do you know that your arms are swinging? Oh, I usually tell people they should be able to see their hands in their lower peripheral vision. Right. Yeah. So yeah. If, you're looking, if you're looking straight ahead and you're walking, you should probably be able to see your hands move as you're. Or what I'll do is I'll get people to just kind of like wiggle their arms out, and then I tell them to not move their arms, but walk quickly, and then eventually their arms will start to move. If they're just letting their arms be loose like noodles. Eventually their arms will start because that wave goes from the foot, that wave that that goes turning back and forth will go from the feet up through the body. And then if the arms are not pinned to your sides, like you're used to when you're holding two newspapers under there, Swing the, the, the noodle Who's arms are just kind of marching around. Do you know? they still make newspaper magazines? <laughs> I, I, think, I think my I think my 89 year old mother still gets the, the Sunday. When you're, yeah. What a novelty that is. Right. It's, it's like when you it's see very a small. Phone, but it's for you see a phone booth, you see a rotary phone. Oh my. Oh my. Yeah. It's it's yeah, it keeps what year is this? Uh, yeah. No. What <laughs> day is it? What um, is it? Yes. Well, that's a great I'm gonna be able to put a pretty funny video clip in for that one. Uh but yeah, so heel heel strike rolling through the whole foot, arms, arms are gently swinging, you're you're moving straight ahead and you're not feeling like you're teeter tottering through space. Yeah. Um Another I, one, I, I go ahead. You you go. No, well, the no. last one I wanted to say is just the the height that people need to try to maintain through their body and not like staring at their feet and slouching too much. And it's not this like hyper posture response. It's just looking. I tell people to look over a fence that's in front of you and kind of keep looking right. over the fence. Aim aim high with your yeah. Vision. Like stare at the top of the horizon and just kind of keep your your head on the clouds. Yeah. So like if, if you drive a car, you don't stare at the front end of the car and to the road, you look out where you're headed. So so think about the same concept. So just aim high. Yeah. Yeah. Was there something else? That, was that what you wanted to add or did you got something else? Well, yeah. OK, so we're giving cues on, on like how to walk more effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Common mistakes, too, I think would be helpful. Don't drive yourself crazy. Don't turn walking into a thinking process. OK, happy medium periodically check yourself right don't don't go out and then try to drive yourself mad by maintaining these cues thinking that you're going to do them perfectly every time because you're not sure right? the idea is is to periodically be able to capture these concepts yeah and if i could so let me let me try to simplify because i feel like i did kind of talk in a gigantic circle there for everyone trying to cram this information and the things that i will usually give people as takeaways are Heel to toe, that rolling through the foot, arm swing, and staying staying high with the vision. Real Three simple. things. Real simple. Real simple. Yeah. And then like check check in, check in with yourself, like Bill is saying. Yeah. If that ankle thing is pinching, no matter what you're doing, maybe dial it back a little bit. Maybe go get on a bike and then talk to your PT or your coach and say, like, I just can't get over this, this foot thing. Cause sometimes we our compensations are so outside of our ability to perceive them that it's you take you take a car that's just completely out of alignment everything is twisted in one direction and then i could i can realign sort of the wheels to go straight still but without knowing that everything is rotated and you can see this the easiest way to see this is just in people's faces and twists and stuff that happen through the face like we still try to we're always going to try to orient ourselves straight ahead so there's always these 
these indications of what that looks like. If you look at sculpture, you can see a lot of people who had to stand in a very uh, stationary position for a long period of time and be sculpted, like Michelangelo's David's a good one. He's very twisted and sort of oriented. Venus. Is Venus Venus in that too? Is um, it yeah, I think is it contra contrapasto. Contra I, yeah, I don't. It's I don't yeah. know. But it's anyone that's anyone that sat for a portrait or sat for a they all have we all have like I mentioned earlier these paths of least resistance and we we'll all kind of sink into certain ways and just because we want to go straight ahead we'll just sort of orient ourselves so sometimes that can that twist can go so far that the it's hard to actually get back to being able to turn from side to side really well right okay I think we I think we covered a lot of a lot of stuff there that yeah. is going to be useful for people to to kind of take away and the goal is to get people to ask questions yeah and this in the context of whatever topic we're right. bringing up every week or every couple of weeks that we film these right thus so yeah, can, congratulations to you if you've made it to the end of the video the, the, the statistics and analysis the uh analytics would tell us that you, there are not many of you remaining so um <laughs> if if you are if you are post your favorite uh, comic book sidekick in the comments, and we will Ooh. talk about that. Ooh. <laughs> Reconsider is sponsored by Substance Nutrition. Go to substancenutrition.com. Get your neuro coffee, better coffee, better brain, and synthesis, better protein, better body. Enter the coupon code RECON, R-E-C-O-N, and get free shipping on all of your orders.